If you want to grow food, most of us eat food that's been produced by farmers or horticulturists or whatever they call themselves, but those, those pro-food producers. Let's have a look at their situation at the moment. Average age approaching 60, I relate to them well. Average debt, $400,000. 70% of farmers made an annual loss for each of the last five years. How are they still there? Because they don't own their farm anymore. And where are they going to retire to? Well, that'll depend on the pension. So how do some of these younger farmers survive? Well, usually they survive on the partner's wage earned off farm. So half of the farmers who are out there get all of the spending money for their family from their partner's wage. Usually a teacher, a nurse, or whatever. The farm is a joke. Economically, a waste of time. Um, this is getting a bit grim. Um, <laughs> might, might, uh, might, might sort of uh, skip a few pages. Look, um, <laughs> we, 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 really, we, we really need to have uh, a new way of thinking about the way we interact with the land and each other because uh, farmers, farmers actually are, are taking advantage of a whole lot of people in surviving on the land in the miserable manner that they do survive uh, in as much as there's um, a very, very large number of woofers. Uh, some of you don't know what woofers are. Willing workers on organic farms, uh, but they actually work on just about any old farm. Um, and, and they work basically for their keep, so no money changing hands there. And then we have the students from overseas who of course come in on a student working visa, they get paid absolute you know, crap wages, uh, often not up to award standards. And then we have all the Pacific Islanders who come in and work on minimum wage as well. And even with that help, if you like, and I might say that a lot of Riverland properties uh, engage 90% of their workforce from that group of people. So like, it is absolutely vital to horticulture in particular that we have those people. But, but we're actually having a lend of those guys as well. We're enshrining that kind of uh, inequity in the whole system. So uh, I mean, what on earth could we do to uh, overcome that? And a couple of uh, crazy people in Tasmania back in the late 70s, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, Bill was meant to be the mentor and David was meant to be listening to him, but I'm not sure how it really worked. They wrote a book together which was essentially a summary of David's thesis and, uh, and they dreamed up, Bill claims that he, he thought up the title, it was a book called Permaculture One, permanent culture, permanent agriculture, anyway, some way that we could have a sustainable uh, arrangement with this planet that would enable human civilization to go on pretty well. Uh, yeah, for thousands of years anyway. I don't think anyone pretends that this thing's going to go on forever. And they gave it, which is a very rare thing in land use systems, three ethical bases for that particular philosophy and uh, they simply were care of the planet, it's the only one we've got, care for community, we don't want to be fighting with each other and smashing up infrastructure, and the nasty one, the third one, which is to take personal responsibility for population and consumption, i.e. how many kids you have, um, or run over I suppose, but, uh, uh, and, and how much you consume. Uh, and, and, and if you start applying that in your daily life, is it a good idea for you to just drive down the shop and get, you know, one pint of milk? No, damn it, you should walk and you don't, don't need that milk, you should have been weaned years ago. So, uh, so to make judgments every time you are planning the way you run your family, the way you design your home, your house, the way you run your campus, uh, the way you run your business uh, on those principle, on those uh, ethical lines. But to, to help people, they gave us a dozen principles, and uh, I'm not going to go into them tonight because it takes 10 days to teach you this stuff. Just, just accept that uh, there's. Uh, Something like half a million people have done these courses. The graduates universally say it's changed the way they think about things and the way they plan. Uh, it takes you 130 hours of work to do it and that could be uh, done in the form of a 10 day crash course or it could be done over a period of a month or two and you come out of it with a plan of your choice and of your doing 
uh, for whatever the enterprise is that you're thinking about. So permaculture has uh, been very much uh, influential in the thinking of, uh, dare I say, people even in the uh, division in government uh, charged with uh, sustainability and, and climate change. Um, so it, it's, uh, and it's much more popular overseas than it is in Australia because people over there actually get hungry every now and then. Um, now, let's go on to, I'll just skip a few more things, Bruce. Everything's under control. Uh, <laughs> I promised that I'd say something about one of the most important elements in uh, permaculture design, and that would be a design for the city of Adelaide, which of course needs an element called a farmer's market. And, uh, and we've got one. Farmer's markets are the way that you the farmer can get your produce to the consumer and actually put most of that money in your pocket. Uh, this is very rare for farmers. Usually they get a tiny percentage of the final buying price. So uh, there's one at the showgrounds. It operates every Sunday from 9 to 1. If you get there at 1, there's nothing left because the food's so damn good, so damn cheap, and being a member of the market is so beneficial that uh, the place is cleaned out quick smart. So be there at 9 or... Ten past. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it, 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 it keeps going uh, about a hundred businesses. So there are about a hundred farm families that are actually being sustained by that market, turning over about eight million dollars a year in, in uh, their respective pockets and uh, it has saved a lot of those businesses. It has incubated a whole lot of other new businesses. It has been enormously successful. It's a great place to shop because you get the best food from all over the place and you choose what you want to buy. The CSAs, the Community Supported Agriculture Schemes, are where you say, I want a box every week, but you only have very, very minor control over exactly what goes in the box. It's zucchinis again! No! Um, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, you know, they all fit together. All of the things that Claire was talking about, they all fit together and it's going to suit you at different times of your life to be a member of a CSA or a farmer's market or one of the local markets that have sprung up particularly all along the coast, uh, you know, from, from Largs Bay down through to, yeah, just about Christie's. So, uh, very important. Um, and, uh, and there's about 80 farmer's markets in Victoria there's a bit, we're heading for 20 in South Australia and they're you know, bobbing up every week. Now, the thing that I really wanted to just finish on is uh, urban design because most of us live in a city and consume in a city and pollute and you know, outgas in a city. And so urban design is completely critical to any kind of uh, ongoing culture. And Adelaide has done as well as a lot of cities in thinking about this. Let's say the city is essentially round and uh, it's got the CBD right in the middle. And around the CBD it's got parklands, sounding a bit like Adelaide, except Adelaide's sort of football shaped being in South Australia. Um, <laughs> and, and ideally a city would have a whole lot of radiuses, a whole lot of radii going out with heavy rail, in other words, trains. So, hoof, hoof, fast, moving a lot of people really quickly. And they can take the people to the food and the food to the people. People can go to the farmer's market, can go to the community garden quickly and easily using this service. No, and you say, but I'm in that little wedge between that heavy rail track and that heavy rail track, don't worry. Every so many kilometres from the CBD, we've got a circle line, which is a bus service, and that actually interlinks all of those radios. So, so you basically got uh, a transport system, which in Copenhagen, the planners tried to get down to 45 minutes, absolute maximum travel time to work, or commuting, a regular commute across town. 45 minutes. Now, they're, they're getting right to the edge as, as we speak. They've got high speed rail, they've got these fantastic uh, bus services that link up. All of the stations are linked up with interchanges and it's starting to sound like Todd, Transport Oriented Development.